Well, hello, and welcome to the Accessible Experience. Um, and I hope by the end of this, you'll have a better understanding of how to, in your design process, to sort of maximize the number of people that get to enjoy your design. Um, so uh, most of the accessibility talks and presentations that I've seen or read usually deal with the, the coding aspect of it or maybe some of the legal ramifications and have, you know, have following some of the guidelines. Um, this one is, is primarily geared toward designers and how to design a rich experience to maximize the number of people that will enjoy it. So my name is Dan Moyard. I'm the lead front-end developer at Form 1. And I've been working with Drupal for about six years. Um, and I've been doing web development and accessibility for you know, over 10 years. Um, uh, that's my email address, dmoyard at formone.com, if you need to ask me any questions. Um, I'm also, you can also find me at DC Moyard, uh, pretty much anywhere on the internet. That's my uh, Twitter handle, that's my GitHub username, that's my Drupal.org username as well. So feel free to, to ping me if you have any questions. Um, I do a lot of, I've been involved a little bit on some of the Drupal core, uh, the accessibility stuff, and some of the mobile and HTML5 stuff. So I have a lot of experience talking about, you know, accessibility as it relates to Drupal. Um, but this particular talk isn't necessarily about Drupal. It's just about accessibility in design in general. So to get started, I'm going to talk about three main things today. The first is I'm going to talk about the importance of accessibility. You know, what we do has an impact on a lot of people because of the community and how the web works. It, you know, people get connected, and accessibility is a big part of that. I'm also going to talk about the, the four main types of disabilities that we um, normally have to deal with um, whenever we're designing and building for the web. And I'm going to give you some hands-on experience of how, how they experience stuff. Um, and you're all, I'm also going to have a couple of volunteers come up to get ready. Um, just want to try some of this stuff for yourself as well. And then finally, I'm going to talk about some of the specific design considerations um, that you really need to keep in mind during the design process to really make sure, you know, the, the design is accessible and really stands out. So first, first we're going to talk about why is accessibility so important. Um, well, there are, there are three, three main reasons that I like to think of. And the first one... Um, has to do with the, the moral reason. It's a good reason. So this is a, this is a picture of my son, DJ. Uh, he's 10 years old. I have three. He's the oldest, and he was in fifth grade. Um, and about a month ago, he had a class project. Um, and so the, the teacher you know, had emailed all of the, the students in the entire fifth grade saying, hey, if you're interested, you know, we would like some of the kids to interview you about your job, just want to talk about it and stuff. Um, so I, I threw my hat in the ring, and a couple of the kids uh, ended up interviewing me about my job. Um, and there was a lot of really interesting questions, you know, about, like, you know, what kind of education do you need to have? What, you know, what the starting salary? Um, one of the interesting ones was, would you explain your job to me so that I can describe it to another fifth grader? <laughs> yeah, I have a hard time going to cocktail parties and explaining what a front-end developer does. So... But the question that really stuck out at me is one that I had never really thought about at the ask, and it was this. How did your job contribute to making the world better? And that really struck a chord in me, because usually it's not one of, something I really necessarily think about. You know, uh, usually you get a job because you need money. You know, you need to pay the bills, you need to get a, have a place to stay and food. Um, and, and my life philosophy has always been sort of you know, find something that you really enjoy doing that you can get paid at. Uh, and I never really thought about, you know, how, what you do in your job, can you make the world better? And although I've never really, like, had thought about this question before they ask it, um, I must have known subconsciously, because right away, two uh, answers really popped up. The first one is I'm really lucky to work for a company like Form One, um, where a lot of our clients are, like, government organizations or nonprofits, you know, and they're really trying to make a difference in the world. They're really trying to solve some of society's biggest problems. You know, so for example, growing up, you know, I was always into uh, hiking and camping and paddling. And you know, my mom worked for the Department of Environmental Protection, and so I was always really interested in you know conservation and stuff. And it was a big deal for me when I got to work on EPA.gov. You know, to sort of help them, you know, get that message across. You know, try to you know extend their influence 
to what they're doing, and you know, I felt really good about that. The other thing uh, that that question really popped up is accessibility. You know, I've done a lot of accessibility to try to make things easier for people who might have challenges to be able to interact, you know, and be involved in the web. And so there's a great quote by Judith Hyman at the uh, U.S. Department of Education. And she said, for people without disabilities, technology makes things convenient. For people with disabilities, it makes things possible. You know, I'm, you know, I'm legally blind, and I also have hearing impaired. Um, and so I have tunnel vision. So, like, I can look at what I'm looking at, but everything else is kind of hard. Um, and I'm also night blind. So whenever the lights get low, um, it's really hard. And also, you know, whenever there's really bright light, I can't really see that well. You know, and, you know, I was thinking about it. You know, a hundred years ago, there's no way I could really be contributing to society like I do today. You know, to be able to work and sort of, you know, ex expand the horizon of, of how people interact and connect on the web with technology. You know, I might have been able to, you know, I probably would have been a piano player because there were a lot of blind piano players back in the day. I could have done that. Um, and so, so this is just sort of like the, the, the moral reason of why accessibility is so important. But there are others. <laughs> One of them is, of course, the legal reason. You know, it, you know, in, in most cases, it's the law. You know, you can get sued. You know, it's sort of like, you know, if the carrot doesn't work, you need the big stick. You know, it's not my favorite reason, but, you know, it does this because you need to sometimes affect people's bottom line before they pay attention. You know, so in 2006, Target was sued uh, because, you know, people with screen readers could, couldn't, you know, use their online store at all. Um, and, they, and Target ended up having to pay $10 million. You know, and in 2010, Disney was sued because their site was inaccessible. Uh, 2011, Netflix was sued. Um, and actually, the, the cool thing about that suit is that uh, the result was in 2014, this year, is all of their content has to have closed captioning, um, which really helped me a lot. And then the, the final reason I like to talk about, and this is probably going to surprise quite a few of you, um, and that is, everyone is disabled. This is extremely important. Let me say it again. Everyone is disabled. Yeah, I see some of you shaking your heads. Let me explain. So first of all, normally when you think of accessibility, uh, the first thing that you talked about when you talk about web accessibility, uh, you know, the people that are completely blind, they can't see, and so they use screen readers. And so that's usually the first thing you have, oh, yeah, that, and that's what accessibility is. But that's not it. There's a whole range of sort of challenges people face. So it's not just people who are completely blind. It's also people who have low vision. You know, they may have things where they can kind of see, uh, but not. Um, you know, and, and a, a, a big challenge to this one is for those people who are sort of afflicted with that, the most horrible of conditions, right? Getting old. Did you know when you're 40 years old, only half of the light gets through your eye to the cornea as it did for 20 years old. And for people who are 60, only 20% of the light gets through. You know, and I, I posted a joke about it well, maybe a year ago on Twitter, how saying, you know, far in the future, we're going to have all of these you know, anthropologists, you know, looking back, and they get their, what they're going to do is they're going to look at all of these old web designs, and they're going to be able to calculate how old a web designer is by seeing how large their font is. You know, but again, it's not everybody. You know, people with low vision, it's about, I think it's about 9% of the population in America. But again, that's not everybody. I know some of you are still thinking, oh, come on, Dan. That's not everybody. How many of you have, raise your hand if you have a smartphone or a tablet? Yeah, pretty much everybody. This is a tech conference. Uh, have you ever gone outside on a nice sunny day, like here in Austin? You know, you're trying to check your contact, and you sometimes have a little trouble, right? Because of the screen glare. This is what we call a situational disability. You know, where something in your environment really hinders what you can do. You know, or something in, like, the, the, the tools or the devices that you interact with that sort of limits what you can do. Um, and this had a, a wide range of effect of how, you know, the stuff you can build to help, help people who are completely blind or have, have people who have my vision problem, also helps you if you're outside and you can't see your screen. You know, so all of these different things that you can do, making things accessible, they end up helping everybody. 
It makes things a lot easier to deal with. Um, this isn't a new concept. This is actually something from, um, it's been a while in sort of like engineering design and architecture design, something called universal design. Here's a good quote about, like sort of explains universal design. The design of products in an environment to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. And the key part in there is the to greatest extent possible because it really is impossible to create um, a website or application that is completely 100% accessible. There are so many different challenges people have to get. There's such a wide spectrum, you know, but you want to gear towards as many as possible, you know, and create it in such a way that if they do have problems, you know, it, it's coded in such a way that they can get around them rather easily. So let me talk now about the, the, the main disability types that we deal with on the web. And those are vision, hearing, mobility, and people with cognitive problems. And I'll talk about them in this order for, four, for, for two reasons. The first reason is, uh, I think this is usually how the order you usually think of it. You know, in web sense, but usually the first thing you think of is people with vision problems. You know, and then you know you read the, the section five ways like, oh yeah, we need closed captioning for people that can't hear. You know, and then maybe if you get into it a little more, you're like, oh yeah, people who you know might need to use a joystick or something to to you know, people with mobility problems. You know, and then finally the last sort of group you only really think of are those people who have mental challenges to understanding the content. The other reason I'm doing this order is because it's actually um, the order in which for the number of people that it affects. Now, it's really hard to sort of like get concrete data and statistics and accessibility, but the general rule of thumb is there are more people who have low vision problems than there are people who are blind. And there are more people who have hearing problems than there are people who have vision problems. And there are more people who have, you know, limited mobility than have hearing problems. And there are more people who have cognitive issues than all of the others combined. So let's take a deep dive first into vision. So these are some of the, just a few of like the, the vision impairment that you deal with. You know, not, you know, as I said before, it's a wide spectrum. It's not just people who are completely blind. It's low vision, maybe different, you know, they might have something that affects their range of vision, you know, or, you know, they have trouble seeing color. You know, or the, you know, the light sensitivity. You know, it's also for people who, you know, it's situational, like the screen that I mentioned before. You know, or, you know, a couple of years ago, I was working with a designer, you know, and, and she had put a whole lot of effort into sort of like getting the color perfect because the client was really picky. You know, when the client calls in during the meeting, she's, you know, she's, I, I'm, I'm really disappointed. Like, I, I wanted the blue background. I don't want this purple. You know, and we're all scratching our heads. Purple. And it turns out, you know, the client had an uncalibrated monitor. You know, something instead of, you know, as a designer, you usually have all the latest and greatest, and so you need to sort of think about all these, you know, situations people might be in. Okay, now for some of the examples. So here's a screen reader example. So first of all, the, the four main screen readers that I like to sort of talk about. Um, the, the easiest one, if you have a Mac, um, is VoiceOver. It's already built in, um, and it's really easy to get it up and started and running. Um, another easy one is Chromevox. So this is a, uh, an extension for the Chrome browser. Um, so it works in you know, Windows, Linux, and Mac. Um, and they have an, a really excellent tutorial. Um, if you follow the link on the slide, uh, it really goes through you know, how to navigate, and it, and it does a really good job. The one, the one thing to keep in mind for Chromevox, though, is although it's very easy, it does work differently than all the other screen readers. So you're going to get slightly different on how other screen readers act. But it's a really good job to sort of quickly see what some of the problem areas might be. The next one is NVDA. Um, this is actually an open source one. Um, and it's completely free. Um, they've really been doing a lot of good work, especially recently. They've been re really ramping up and really pushing the envelope of what screen readers can do. And then finally is JAWS, uh, which I like to think of as sort of like the Microsoft of the screen readers. You know, they're kind of old, they're expensive, um, and there's a you know, but unfortunately, there are a lot of people who still have to use it, especially if they're on, like, old Windows machines. So let's do a demo. So this is for, uh, I'm going to demo VoiceOver. And we're going to take a look at this site. Um, if you want to, you can, you know, if you're on your laptop or your phone, go to this site. 
you can see it. And so this is Mary Jan. Voice over on Rome. Marchin Foods Ramen Noodles Vertical Line American Instant Lunch Vertical Line Ramen Recipes Japanese Ramen Noodles Vertical Line American Yakisoba Window Marchin Foods Ramen Noodles Vertical Line American Instant Lunch Vertical Line Ramen Recipes Japanese Ramen Noodles Vertical Line American Yakisoba HTML Content Has Keyboard Focus And that was just the title. <laughs> Link Image American Ramen Noodles Ramen Recipes Japanese Ramen Noodles Link Slash What's that about? Internal Link Slash I wonder what that's about. Link image. American ramen noodles, ramen recipes. Japanese ramen noodles. I guess every link is about these ramen noodles. Link image. American ramen noodles, ramen recipes. Japanese ramen noodles. Link image. American ramen noodles, ramen recipes. Jet link image. American ramen noodles, ramen recipes. Link image. American ramen noodles, ramen recipes. Japanese ramen. Link image. American ramen noodles, ramen recipes. Japanese ramen noodles. I think they might have hired like an SEO expert that just kind of like vomited on the page, don't you think? You are currently on a link inside the bench. Voice over off. So, yeah, it's always good to test your site in a, in a screen reader. Just sort of like, you can easily catch some of these issues. Okay, so next, I'm sure a lot of you have a smartphone. Get them out. I'm going to give you two minutes. Um, try to follow these steps and, and just try to see if you can get some like the, the, you know, like if you have Android, the talk back or the voiceover on your the smartphone. And just, you know, sometime just go to like a site you've worked on you know, or other sites and just sort of browse around with these different settings and just you'll get a, an entirely new perspective, you know, on how you have to deal with these. And not only will it help you understand, you know, having to deal with these issues on websites, it also comes in really handy when you're outside and it's really sunny and you can't see anything. Just turn this on and it'll sort of like read back to you, you know, like whatever the, the Google map directions might happen to be. Oh, and a, a word of warning. Uh, I gave this talk one time, and somebody came up to me after the talk, and he's like, you got to help me. I don't know how to get out of this. <laughs> so if you, if you run into that problem, come see me afterwards, and I'll try to get it sorted out for you. <laughs> I guess some of you are stuck already. <laughs> okay, you got about 20 seconds. You know, and please feel free, you know, after the conference or later, you know, just, just sort of go ahead and, you know, play around with this. Okay, so next is I want to talk about is sort of like the, some of the, the color contrast, especially for people who have photophobia. So photophobia is not, you know, being deathly afraid of light. It's actually people who are very sensitive to light, and people who have low vision problems tend to have photophobia more often than the average population. And this is a great um, sort of a quote that I read, you know, probably, I don't know, maybe six or seven years ago on the web of describing how it is for someone with photophobia to, to read. And he said, black text on white is like looking at ants on a light bulb. You know, so there, there have been a lot of research, you know, to say, you know, because usually when you think of, you know, like the, the color contrast, the text and the background, people usually fall into two categories. Either they prefer the dark text of a light background or they prefer the light text over a dark background. You know, and there's slightly more people prefer the dark text of a light background. Um, and there's been some studies, um, there were some older studies that said, you know, it's better to have the dark text over the light background. Uh, but more recent studies have actually shown that it's not really, doesn't really make a difference, you know, whether it's dark on white or white on dark. You know, the key thing is the luminance, the, the contrast. It's not necessarily what those colors are. No, but do keep in mind, if you are designing something with a, like a white background, um, try to reduce the contrast a bit, you know, so it's not completely white. It's maybe a little bit of off-white. So that really cuts down on the glare for people with photophobia. Okay, here I come to the magic of this session. So this is our, uh, you know, the, the Drupal.org homepage. And I'm going to give you these, these are images that I've created to sort of reproduce what people with different vision problems, how they would see it. So this is how it would look out of the box. You know, for people with normal vision, this is what it looks like. This is what that same website would look like for somebody who has photophobia. 
Do you notice any real difference? Let me switch back real quick. So you can see that the really bright areas sort of bleed into the other stuff. Now, this is one of the reasons why you know, having really thin fonts can sometimes be problematic. So this is uh, for someone who has deuteronopia. So for color blindness, uh, they're basically, they fall into three categories. You know? So in your eyes, you can sort of, you know, you can understand like the red lights, the green lights, and the blue lights. And so the color blindness, is, you know, it happens whenever one of those three, you, you know, or any combination of them, you sort of lose the ability you know, to sort of distinguish. So deuteronopia is like for people who have or can't see anything about the green color spectrum. Um, this is the most popular one, and it uh, affects men a lot more than women. So this is the same thing with protonopia. This is for people who have trouble seeing red. And you'll see they're actually very similar. Um, that's why, you know, you normally think of, you know, red, green, color blindness, because these two things look very similar. Uh, the one big difference between these two is that people who can't really see red, the protonopia, is that the red becomes almost dark and black. So you have to be really careful when you combine, you know, red and black. So here's somebody with macular degeneration. You know, so in your eyes, you have the cones and the rods. Now, there are sort of, you know, two different vision mechanisms. You know, one focuses on what you can see, the visual acuity, and the other is, is responsible for the peripheral vision. And so you know, there's, there's, a, you know, there's wet and dry macular degeneration, and it has you know, different stages. And so keep in mind you know, that you want to make sure that text is big enough and stuff and understandable so that if they can't see exactly where they're looking, they can still might get a hint to what they're seeing from their peripheral vision. You know, inversely, this is what someone with tunnel vision, how they would see the site. You know, what they're looking at looks really good, but the stuff on the outside, you know, they, they can't really see. You know, so if you have a lot of stuff going on your page, it might be hard for them to sort of, you know, go through the site with, you know, it's like binoculars trying to find that specific, what, you know, trying to find out their location. Okay, so next let's go to sort of the hearing impairment. You know, again, it, uh, as I said before, it's the whole spectrum. It's not just people who are completely deaf. It's also people who might, you know, have some hearing loss. You know, whether it's permanent, whether it's uh, temporary. You know, you had a really loud concert the other night, and the next day you still have a little ringing. Um, and it's also of the, the situational disabilities. You know, so you might have, you know, a computer, you know, and the speakers are broken. You know, or you're out and you don't have headphones, and the, and the volume doesn't work. Okay, so here is a great video. So I'm from the, the D.C. area. I'm in uh, Maryland, just outside. And this is a, a video from Gaidet University. This is a university for uh, people who are hard of hearing. Anybody having trouble with what they're saying? Understanding? I think it's a really great video because they really highlight the importance of closed captioning. You know, they sort of like flip the, the switch on you. You know, so hey, you know, we always have trouble. We can't hear it. We need closed captioning. So how about we just sign everything and it'll give them a taste of the medicine? So yeah, let, me, let me watch it a little bit more. This time I'll turn captioning on. <laughs> Isn't that cool? How closed captioning can really make a difference and help you understand the content.
Okay, so next let me talk a little bit about the, the mobility impairments. Um, so this is basically people who have trouble sort of moving and be able to control the device that they're currently on. Um, in a lot of cases, it's well, they have an actual physical you know, problem controlling like the mouse or the keyboard or they need a joystick. Um, and it's also for people who might have, you know, you have a mouse and it's broken. It only kind of works, you know, or you have a trackpad and your kid spilled ice cream on it and it doesn't always work. You know, these are some of the, 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 the wide range of mobility impairments. You know, and this also includes, you know, the mobile devices and the touch devices, you know. Like, like when they first came out, like, I had a really hard time, like, going to sites and sort of clicking links because they were so small, you know. They were built for the desktop experience, you know, where you have a small mouse, you know, and we got fat fingers, you know, compared to the desktop mice. So here's, here's another great video. And this one is from a guy that just describes how he's using a joust, which is sort of like a mouth joystick. Hi, my name is Mark. This is how I use my joust too. I'm paralyzed from the shoulders down as a result of a spinal cord injury, and I use my joust all the time, many days, many hours, and I'll show you how I use it. Here is Facebook. I go on Facebook enough that uh, I'm not addicted, but I use enough of it. Here's a post from my mom. She says, uh, Hey, honey, give me a call. And I said, Mom, come on, you were just here for six weeks. We don't have anything left to talk about. Um, another thing I do, I like to plan vacations. Here's looking up some hotels on Expedia and hopefully plan a vacation. Uh, another thing I like to do is watch movies. Here's a movie. This is a movie about, it's an IMAX movie. It's about oil fires that were in Kuwait after the... Um, Iraq invaded Kuwait in the 1990s. Pretty interesting movie. Um, another thing I do here is um, Yelp. So you can read uh, reviews at restaurants. Here's where we're going to go to dinner tonight in Los Angeles, outside of L.A. Um, another thing I do is Skype. Here's Skype. I like to use my webcam that's on top of the monitor. Talk to my grandparents. They are pretty savvy with Skype, considering they are 88 years old. Works pretty well. Um, another thing I do is email. Use Outlook to make, to uh, check email and all that. Try to stay in contact with friends. Um, another thing I use is voice recognition software. Dragon Dictate, uh, or Dragon Naturally Speaking. I mean, I use this in combination with uh, a job, so I'll show you how it works. Wake up. Tonight we are going to eat at Froggy's Fish. Market. Period. Go to sleep. Now you can see it's spelled froggies wrong. It has Fridays instead of froggies. So what I do, if it doesn't know a word, I use this little on-screen keyboard out here, and I'll click using my joust, and I will spell out froggies. That's what is great about the joust. Other uh, on-screen keyboards are not near as accurate as that. You wouldn't be able to hit buttons like this. You wouldn't be able to hover over the key on the keyboard. So then I'll type in my email. That's another useful thing about that on screen. Keyboard, you can program macros so they just hit one button. Types in your whole email address. It's pretty awesome. Um, another thing I do is use Google Earth. Uh so isn't it cool what technology can do these days to sort of help people with these sort of limitations? Okay, now for some audience participation. I have a prize. So I need somebody to volunteer. Anybody? Interesting? Oh, come on. Okay, come on up. Come on up. Yeah, come over here. Dangerous? Yeah, yeah, over here. <laughs> So what here, actually, can you? Here, wait, wait, no, no, you can, no, you can do it. There we go. That'll, oh, okay. that'll work. That'll work. You can right. use it right here. You can look at my screen. So, um, you can follow along. Um, for those of you, um, we're at Craigslist, and so I'm going to give you a minute. Okay. And I want you to find something cool to buy in Austin. Okay. If you can do that, using just this. Oh, this, this by the way. 
um, is like a big trackball. My kids love it. It's also people who have you know, trouble using a regular mouse. So it's a big trackball with two big buttons. So go. <laughs> <laughs> How do I scroll? <laughs> it's two fingers? There's <laughs> a scroll button right. Oh, I don't want to use that. I forgot that existed. <laughs> Alphabetizing is hard. Ten seconds. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, good. Good job. Thank you. Damn it, Slinky. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, that's perfect for my kid. Yeah, okay. You know, and so you can see when you have, you know, just limited by your device, you know, that is another situational disability. You know, it's very hard to sort of move stuff around. So keep that in mind when you're building these sort of complex websites and web apps. Um, they make it easy for people to sort of navigate. You know, again, this is an, uh, you know, another one of those sites um, on mobile devices that can be really hard because the links are very small. You know, and again, with the fat fingers, it's sort of hard to always pick exactly what you want. So we got time for another. So uh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago this came out where uh, there's a new website for the Virgin Atlantic, and this is the, uh, you can follow along that beta, that virginatlantic.com, and it's a really nice design. It got a lot of praise because it's sort of, they were sort of forward thinking. It was sort of like a mobile first, very clean, very intuitive, you know, but they kind of missed something with accessibility. So I need another volunteer. Anybody? Raise your hand. I can only see a little bit, so you might have to, sh so I can see. Anybody? Uh, okay. So can you go to that desk right there, the, the keyboard? Hopefully this still works. Can you go to the site? Okay. okay, so what I want you to do is, wh wh where are you from? Austin. Well, so I want you to find a trip from Austin to anywhere you might want to visit, using just the keyboard. Does anybody know where she might be on the page? Ten seconds left. Okay, well, thank you for participating. Yeah, you can have your five. <laughs> so the big problem with this site is usually when you tab around, you, you know, you want to give feedback of exactly where you are. You know, this is the focus. You know, and what they've done is, you know, some of the stuff, you know, if you highlight over it to hover, you know, there's a slight, you know, underline of stuff, but if you were to tab through it, you have no clue where you are. You know, so always keep that in mind, like, when you're designing, like, these, these interactions. It's not just hover, you know, and click and stuff. It's also focus. Uh, and then the final type of disability I want to talk about is, and again, remember, this is a cognitive impairment. So people who have these outnumber all of the others combined. You know, and this is a, a, a wide range. Of, there's way too many that I could possibly list. This is for people with sort of like sort of, you know, brain trauma, injuries, you know. Um, it could even be, you know, it was like, you know, attention deficit disorder or um, dyslexia, you know, where you have trouble reading certain words. You know, so I think it's like 10% of the people in the U.S. have dyslexia. Uh, there's also people with, you know, memory problems. As you get older, that's why it's always good to build sort of form you know, like if you have like a multi-step form that kind of saves the stuff they've already entered and put it in. 
You know, but it's also stuff with sort of situational disabilities. You know, um, you know for example, maybe, you know, have, have you ever seen like a, like a foreign website you when know, you got there accidentally? Um, and if it's a good website, you still kind of know what's going on. You know, so this is the, the first one. Well, so first, let me talk about this one. So again, this is the really distracting site. Let me get it loaded up. You're going to love this. You're going to love this. There we go. And so you want to be able to sort of focus on the content, right? You go to a website. You want to know what you have to do. So how fast do you think you can lease a car on that site? <laughs> huh? Especially if you were distracted, you know, you're at the, I don't know, maybe you're at the grocery store and your kids are pulling on your arm trying to get you to grab cereal or candy and you're looking at the website because you need to lease a car right away because the one in the parking lot just blew up. You know, there's a lot of distraction. You can't really understand what's going on. You know, and as I mentioned before about the, the foreign, oh, wait a minute, I completed this, sorry. So, like, what you would only do as far as sort of the attention stuff is you want to sort of like, so for Medium, if, if you're not aware of it, sort of like a new sort of a blogging platform. And what they've really done, they put a lot of effort into like having a narrow focus, making it very easy to do whatever your focus is at that moment. You know, so if your focus is to read a website, an article, <laughs> you can very easily read it. There's no sort of extraneous distractions. You know, and the, the authoring experience is, is very similar. It's just, just these very simple tech fields to sort of, you know, add, you know, update the content. And they've even taken a step further, like whenever you want to search for something, you know, it just sort of gets rid of all the other distractions that might be there. So just focus on the search. You know, then again, you know, with, with the, if you don't know... The language, you know, that's another sort of cognitive, you know, barrier for you to sort of what's going on. And this is a good example of a site in Japanese where even though I can't read Japanese or understand it, I, I can still get a good idea of what's going on because they have, you know, they have pictures that explain. Um, they have icons with words, um, you know, all the buttons and stuff. You know, there's all these, you know, what they call visual affordances, you know, like little textual, contextual clues that give you a hint about what something is and how it functions. Okay, so for the final part of the talk, I want to talk about sort of the specific design considerations. And the fourth thing that I'm going to talk about are animation, uh, typography, color, and then sort of how to have a visual, effective communication. So the first I'm going to talk about, because this is uh, the first thing, the, probably one of the few things that the designer, you need to really be aware of, because this can actually have physical, medical ramifications on people. So in 1997, in Japan, there was an episode of Pokemon. And for about 30 seconds in this short scene, the, the background flashed completely red and blue for just 30 seconds. And because of that 30 seconds, thousands of people ended up having to go to the hospital in Japan. You know, some had full-on epileptic seizures. Others had, like, really, like, migraine headaches and, you know, upset stomach, nausea. You know, bad enough that they had to go to the hospital. You know, and imagine all the people that had these symptoms, but they weren't quite bad enough that they wanted to go to the hospital. You know, so the, the general rule of thumb is you really want to avoid any sort of flashing. Um, you can have a little bit. Uh, the, the, the basic rule of thumb is you don't want to have anything flash, uh, I think it's more than three times in one second. 
you know, but really sort of eliminate it if you can. Um, and some of the spec can go in some detail, so like some of the really slow or faster you might be able to get away with, but in general, just avoid it. Um, and if it's, a, if it's a really legitimate requirement in the design, really do your homework to figure out exactly what those are. So this is something that came up uh, a couple months ago. I'm um, sort of like the front end circle, the design circle, CSS shake. And so this is using sort of the new CSS3 sort of uh, you know, transitions and stuff so you can sort of do stuff. So here's an example. You know, you go on something and it shakes. And this is kind of a cool novelty effect, but it can be dangerous. You know, like the Ling's cars, it can be really, you know, this. So some of these, where do we go? Like some of these examples, it's like constantly shaking. I passed it, didn't I? Yeah, I, I can't even read that page. White and yellow. Yeah, but, but some of these, like, so for some of these, like, it just shakes the entire time. You know, and you really want to limit it to just, like, very small interaction, like, just when they're inter interested in that particular part of the page. Okay, so next is typography. So typography, I think, is sort of like, like, what, 90% of web design? You know, unless you have, like, a really video-heavy site where that's your main content, you know. But even YouTube, you know, I mean, they put, you know, effort and consideration into the typography because it's all about text and word that you need to read. And this is a great quote from Imo Ruto. He was sort of, like, big in the, the, the Swiss design school. And he said, a printed work which cannot be read becomes a product without purpose. You know, so I highly encourage, um, if you aren't already, to really read up on typography. Learn about what makes things readable, what makes things uh, legible. Um, you really want to have, you know, large enough font sizes so that people can actually see. Um, you really want to pay attention to how you sort of emphasize text, you know, like with italics um, and bold. And you have to be really careful at some of the smaller font sizes. Uh, you really want to pay attention to line length, you know, the measure. Um, as well as the line height, you know, the letting between stuff and spaces between paragraphs and having stuff left aligned um, to make it easier to skim. So, you know, so I, you know, that makes a big deal typography-wise for people who have trouble reading. You know, whether through cognitive issues like dyslexia or vision problems. You know, it really makes them, so they can actually see it. And not only that, it really polishes the design. So even if you don't have you know, some sort of physical limitation of reading it, it makes the experience so much nicer. Another thing I want to talk about for typography is the color contrast. This is one of the sort of can really get people. Um, and so you really want to be, have enough contrast between the text and the background. Uh, you can get away with having sort of like these slight color variations for like the background or for some of the, the non-essential stuff. You know, but for the text that the people are reading, the information they really need, you know, you want to make it obvious that they can actually read it and understand it. So, and this is a great site, contrastedrebellion.com. Uh, Could you check it out? It does a really great job of arguing the point that you can have an excellent design with high contrast. You know, it's not just a really ugly black and white site. You know, you can do a lot of things with color that is still have enough contrast and make it readable. You know, there's a lot of, like, for example, for, for me, for example, so, like, I have a really hard time reading um, dark text on white. And a really cool thing that I can do on Mac is I can just hit, you know, Control, Option, Shift, 8, and it just inverts it. So it makes it very easy for me to read. So that's another thing to keep in mind is when you're designing color contrast, is that if you invert it, make sure that it still looks good. You know, it's not a high priority, but you know, make sure at least it's still legible. Um, here are some really cool uh, sort of the color tools that, that I think can really help them. Um, just recently, I think within the past year or so, Photoshop actually put it in, uh, so you can actually sort of proof what your design in Photoshop looks like, um, and, you, and you can do it for I think for like red color blindness and green color blindness. Uh, and then my favorite tool is the, the Color Oracle. And this is sort of like a standalone program or application. Uh, it works on Windows, Linux, and Mac. 
and it allows you to very quickly see what something looks like with deuteranopia or protonopia, the red color binding and green color binding. So for example, this is what these slides look like if you can't really see green that well. Or if you can't see red all that well. It makes it really easy. I really I love that tool. Um, there's also the color filter um, at workline.org. This is the one where you can sort of type in an address of any site, and you can get a preview of what it looks like with all these various sort of color blindness issues. And then finally, I my favorite sort of like tool for seeing exactly how much contrast there is, you know, does it meet the, the WCAG guidelines? Um, is the one done by Lee Rue. You know, she's a, a wonderful developer uh, on the CSS working group. Mad skills and CSS and JavaScript and stuff. And I, so I love that tool. Um, and on that one, you know, it does a really good job of storage. You know, you put in two num you know, color values, CSS color values, and it'll give you exactly how much color contrast there is. You know, and it also tells you whether it meets you know, the, the single A, double A, or triple A. Um, and my rule of thumb is you really want to aim for triple A. Um, and I'd like to aim for right where it hits the triple A, um, but not more than that. Because again, too much con contrast can sometimes hurt people who are dyslexic. And then finally, the segue into my last one is you want to use more than color to convey meaning. So can I have everybody, can you raise both your hands? Raise your hands, come on. All right, because you need to pay attention. No more laptops and smartphones for the next second. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to show the next slide really quick. Like as fast as I can, show it and come back. And you need to pay attention because this, this is a, this is difficult. You got to pay attention, and I need you to tell me what you think it is. So what was that? What? You got it. It was less than a second. It is a stop sign. So why do you think? And this should really boggle your mind that that quickly you were able to guess because it's it's a really it's a terrible picture, isn't it? You can't see the entire sign. It's kind of blurry. So why do you think you could understand what it was so quickly? No. I'm sorry? The color, right, the red. Yeah, you can use color as a design tool. It is very powerful to convey information. You know, but again, if you have, can't see it, you know, it gets really dark. So what are the other clues to tell you? Shape. The shape. That's right. What else? I'm sorry? The text. The text, right. It actually says stop. You ever been to them in the foreign countries that have stop signs? You still know they're a stop sign. It just doesn't say stop. It says like alto or you, know, you go to Turkey. You know, that it's something pretty different, but you still know it's a stop sign. What else? I'm sorry? Yes, the line. That's also another one. It's also the brightness. So even though you can't really see the color, like if it's black or white, you can't see red, there's enough of a luminance variation between the red and the white that it stands out. It's not just the color hue. Also, the, the combination of empty space and, you know, all of it. So you, you know what that looks like. You know there's an empty space on top of the stop. Yeah. On top of the letters, you, you recognize that. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And so, so there's two more clues that this is a stop sign. And it's probably going to be very hard for you to guess what these are, unless you happen to be following along on the slide. I posted uh, the, the slides are on GitHub. So this whole presentation is done using HTML and CSS and JavaScript, and something called impress.js. And if you happen to be following along and you look in the, here, let me just show you. You take a look at this, the URL. It says stop sign. You know, so again, you need to think about the URL as another thing to design to make it very easy for people to know where they are on the website. And then there's one final one that you're probably not going to know, notice, unless you happen to be seeing, looking at these slides with a screen reader. 
Okay, so each of these slides, you know, I'm using the HTML5 article tags and stuff, and they all have headings. And, and for the ones that have pictures, I've hidden the headings with CSS in such a way that you can't visually see them, but with a screen reader, you can still hear them. And it, so it would say, stop sign. And so it's very important sort of to sort of use as many different design techniques to get your point across. You know, like whatever your thing you're designing, use as many different elements as possible to say exactly, hey, this is a button. You should be clicking this. This goes to the shopping cart. You know, hey, this is a link. This should, it takes you to the FAQ if you want to have questions. You know, and all these design elements, you know, design the call to action, then the sidebar, then the login boxes. Designing with all of these different tools to make it obvious what they are. You know, not only does it help people who might not be able to see color and they have other clues to tell them what they are, but just for general people to have no problem, you know, it adds that polish and makes it much easier to understand, you know, what you're trying to communicate. You know, the, the really good analogy I like to use for this is, you know, sort of like the teaching methodology. You know, like, you know, they say, you know, like people sort of like have different ways that they learn. Like some people are visual learners. You know, if they see something, you know, they can understand it. You know, others were like they need to read something, you know, before they really understand it. And other people are like, well, they need something hands-on. You know, if you give them an activity and they actually work on it, it really helps it go. You know, and the best teachers try to use as many of these different techniques as possible to sort of convey the information, make it obvious, and make the information stick in. So that's the end of this talk. Um, thank you very much. Um, and please, I encourage you to go to the, the website for the session and rate it. Um, it, it, it. They give the feedback back to the speakers. Um, so we get a better understanding of, you know, what we can do better, you know, what we like, what we should keep doing. And it's also very helpful for the, the, the DrupalCon Association to sort of figure out what speakers they want and what topic they find that they should continue in the future. So now we have time. Let's see. We've got about eight minutes or so for questions. Um, and again, you can get these slides um, at GitHub at the top. Um, you can also ping me on Twitter if you have any questions. Um, and also, there is going to be, uh, this afternoon at 345, uh, there's going to be a BOF on the accessibility in Drupal 8. So, any questions? Uh, yeah, what's the yeah. most effective way? I'm sorry, can you speak up? The mic's is not it, working too well. Uh, what's the most effective way to convince a client they need to uh, change their design for accessibility reasons? Okay, so the question is, how do you convince client accessibility in the design is important? So usually um, what happens, you know, far too often is in the design process, you don't really think about accessibility. You know, it's like accessibility, yeah, it's important, but we can do it at the end. You know, tag it on at the end. That can be part of QA or something, you know. Or, you know, that, you know that's something that coders have to deal with. That, you know, designers don't need to. You know, but it is very important to have it throughout the process, you know, making accessibility a key part of your metric. You know, so like at Four Month we use the agile, you know, process. And on every single story we have, we have stories for design and story for building, we make, you know, being something it being accessible, whatever you're working on, as one of the acceptance criteria. You know, and so to convince your clients um, who might not be willing to do that, you say, hey, it's not just you know, you you're limiting, you know, your customer base, you know. Because, you know, people don't really realize just how many people have these problems. You know, and again, it's not just people who are completely blind, you know, or have low vision. It's all people who have situational disabilities. You know, so it affects a lot more people than clients might realize. And paying attention to accessibility makes the design better. Any other questions? Yeah. Hello. We moved over here. Okay. Hi. Sure. Um, what, in the example, the medium example, it had like uh, text over images. Obviously, that's a huge trend right now. Um, what do you think about that? Because it's hard to really judge the contrast through a tool like you showed in GitHub. Yeah, it can be, can be kind of different if you have text with uh, image backgrounds. You really need to pay attention. It can't just be sort of a you know, one size fits all. You can put it in any image. Because you know, the colors in the image make a big difference as far as the, the background. So you can either have, like, if you have, like, a background image, like a banner on a page, and you have the text at the bottom, 
and you're going to have like different images either rotating or maybe there's a different image on different sections of the site, is maybe put like a little gradient behind it. So no matter what, even if there's something white, that gradient gives it enough contrast that you can still read the text. Okay. And a second question I had, um, do you have resources for, like we're considering like fonts that we want to use. Do you have resources which recommend certain fonts which are good for accessibility or so, readability? Um, well, there are, there is, I know, a font specifically designed for dyslexic users. Um, I think that's pretty much of an edge case, though. Um, but in general, um, for, like, choosing font, it's usually the ones that are more legible. Um, it, 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 you know, the, the top, I mean, usually designers don't pick the bad fonts. You know, as long as you can read it. You know, if you try to get fancy, you know, you want to get the message across and, you know, make the, like sometimes you can get away, it's like on a poster. Sometimes the big posters day and they have like these weird fonts you can barely read. But it's part of like that artistic experience, trying to figure out what it says. You really don't want to do that on the web. Um, and so as far as like choosing serif or sans serif fonts, um, it, as long as like with the, the, the modern devices, you don't need to worry so much about avoiding serif fonts, you know, um, unless... You might want to avoid it, though, on, like, some of the really small font sizes. So, like, on the teasers or the byline that have small text, you might want to try sans serif rather than serif. Okay, great. Thanks. Sure. Can I have a question? Sure. Go ahead. You made a reference to uh, A, AA, and AAA. Okay. Can you give sure. a little more information on that? Sure. Yeah, so... Uh, the, the WCC, who does the standards for HTML, CSS, and a whole bunch of other stuff, um, they have something called WAI, which is the Web Accessibility Initiative. And one of the things they've come out with is the WCAG, which is the Web Content Accessibility Guideline. Um, and there's a 2.0 version, and this is sort of like the, the, the guiding principle in the, in internationally right now as far as how to make things accessible. And there's a lot of stuff on you know, how to make text readable, how to make links and buttons work. And, so, and one of them is color contrast. And so there's sort of a specific formula to determine sort of like the luminant color contrast between two specific colors. You know, and there's an actual formula that said, you know, if it's so much of a color contrast ratio, you know, it's a, it's a double A. So it, you can kind of see it, but some people might have problems. And then there's the triple A, where it goes even further, where you know the, it's a lot more of a contrast, and so more people will be able to understand it. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question. I'll, I'll come up. Okay. <laughs> 